Okay. So uh, this talk is going to be about a topic that is in between distributed computing and cryptography. My background is in distributed computing. I am having a lot of fun playing with tools from cryptography, and I wanted to tell you guys about it a little. So the outline for the talk, um, I'm going to start by telling you about a fairly classical model in distributed computing, which is over 20 years old at this point, and it is called a distributed application. So I'll tell you about the classical stuff. I'll tell you about some drawbacks of the classical stuff, which motivated us to look at a different version of it, and then I'll present our work on a computationally sound version of this model, and this is uh, a paper in TCC a couple of months ago. It is joint work with my student, Edin Aldemachiva, who just started a PhD at Tel Aviv University with us, and also uh, with a couple of two crypto people, just so I have the correct credentials here. So it is with Elect Boyle and Ron Cohen and Tal Moran from IDC here at Syria. All right, so the, the classical model for distributed certification. The basic setup here is that we have a distributed network, and every node in this network has some input. And together, <laughs> the network and the input are called the configuration. And since this is a distributed network, every node in this network is operating individually and making their own decisions and sending messages and deciding what to do. Um, and initially, what they know here, they each have a unique identifier, which they know. They have access to their neighbors and their identifiers. Uh, and they know their input, but only their own input, X of V. And that's all that they know initially. And the goal for us is to verify that some global property of this configuration holds. So even though every node only has this extremely local perspective, I still want to check some global property of the entire network. So obviously, I won't be able to do this without talking among the nodes. And in this model, actually, we're going to have help from an all-powerful prover. Uh, some of the slides here were from a talk in Italy, so all of the artwork <laughs> <laughs> from Italy. <laughs> So the prover is this all-powerful and all-knowing entity can see the entire network, unlike the nodes in the network. And what it wants to do is convince us that the property holds. So this is like a distributed version of NP in the sense that the prover wants to make you say yes. Even when you should say no, the prover wants to make you say yes. So what does the prover actually do? It computes certificates for the nodes. So I said this is like NP, there is going to be a witness. And the witness here is just a bunch of certificates that the prover computes. And it gives every node its own certificate. It can be a different certificate for each node in the network. And then the nodes check if they're happy with this witness or not. So every node looks at its own certificate, the certificates of its neighbors, and its own input, and it decides if it's happy or not happy, if it accepts or rejects. And this is a decision that is made individually by each node, but I'm going to consider this proof or this witness to be accepted only if everybody accepts it. So it's enough for one node to say, no, the prover is trying to cheat here, I'm not convinced, and it's considered to be rejected. And so, but you need them to tell each other that they accept it, or no. you're happy? I'm happy as soon as one of them said no. And this is kind of encapsulating a building block where once one of them says no, yeah, you should probably do something about that, but that's not part of the problem we're looking at here. Here it's just about having one person recognize that something is right. So, if, for example, the problem was whether the network is the color of the road and the certificate was this. Right. Color for each that's yes. consistent with the neighbors, then you are happy. Yes. No communication, everybody accepts. Well, there is communication implicitly because you have to. So, how do you get the oh, certificates get from neighbors, your neighbors? Yeah, yeah, they have to yeah. send you their yeah, certificates, yeah, okay. right? And you don't know yeah. it. But yeah, for three color ability, it's a great example. What the prover would do, it would tell every node, here is your color, a number from one to three. And then every node would look at the neighbor's colors and just make sure that they're all different from its own color. And if they are, it would accept, and if they're not, it would reject, 
right? And the network is colored properly if and only if. Okay, so what we want is the same as in NP. We want completeness. If the property does hold, then there is a witness, a certificate assignment that the clover could compute that would make everybody accept. And also soundness, if the property doesn't hold, then nothing the prover does will convince everybody to accept. There will always be somebody that notices something wrong, but it can be a different node for every certificate assignment. Okay, so let me give you a, a few uh, examples just to see what uh, the boundaries are of the sandbox that you're playing in. So first off, you can prove anything in this model. And the complexity won't even be too bad. So if you give every node the certificate whose length is n squared bits plus the length of the entire input, then you can prove anything. By just telling every node, here is the full configuration. Here is the network graph, and here is the input to everybody. Of course, the prover can say that, but we don't trust that they're not lying to us. So how do we check that? You need to do two things to check it. First off, every node looks at their own perspective and they make sure that the prover described it correctly. Like if the prover says node one is a neighbor of node two and I am node one, I should make sure that node two is my neighbor. The other thing you need to do is make sure that the prover isn't saying different things to different nodes because it could cheat that way too. But that's also easy to do. You just look at your neighbor's certificates and you make sure that we all got the same. Right, and you can see already some interesting property arising here out of these local checks. I am just comparing certificates with my neighbors. Already I'm getting this global property that this is the correct entire configuration. <coughs> That's the point of this model. I'm not sure why you can't approve uh, that the graph is connected even though it's not. Okay, I am making some assumptions oh, which I okay. didn't talk about. Usually we only consider connected graphs in this model because if there is a partition, there, there's nothing that I can do to detect it. That's very common for distributed algorithms. But I'll show one example actually where um, I am going to talk about connectivity directly. Were there other questions here? I saw some. Uh... It's the same question. Okay, yeah. So there has to be some underlying assumption, which is either the network is connected or if it may not be connected, you need to know something more like in the example that I shall uh, show next. So here's the next example, connectivity. <laughs> so I'd like to make sure here that the network is connected, but here I know the size of the network. I know that it should be of size n. So I'm allowed to reject if I detect that the network is smaller than size n or bigger than size n. <laughs> okay, so how can the prover convince me of this fact? This is a, a very classical, uh, uh, scheme, which is from the very first paper by uh, Kuta and Coleman and Peleg, they said basically, let's ask the prover to specify a spanning tree of this network. How does it do that in a distributed network? It tells every node, this is your parent in the tree, and this is your distance from the root of the tree, and this is the size of your subtree. And then what do I need to check to make sure I believe this? First off, I have to verify that the distances are consistent. So either I am claimed to be the root, distance from the root is zero, or my distance from the root is one more than my parent's distance. Then I need to make sure that the size of my subtree is one more than all of my children's subtrees. And the final thing is if I'm the root or I'm claimed to be the root, then I need to make sure that my subtree includes n nodes. And it's easy to prove just by reduction on these distances that if indeed uh, all of these checks succeed, <coughs> then the network is a connected network of size. And this is super useful as the building blocks to prove other, for example, a property we often want to prove in distributed algorithms. Uh, I want to prove that I have managed to elect one node in this network to be the leader, which will then decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. There has to be a leader, and there should be at most one leader. Right? So how do I check that? First of all, what is the problem specification? So every node is given an input bit. I want to make sure that uh, exactly one node is marked. 
Is there exactly one node whose bit is one? And the way we're going to verify this is actually just give me a spanning tree where the root is the leader. And then we verify the spanning tree the same way that we did before. The root verifies that it is marked. The node that is not the root, whose distance is more than a zero from the root, verifies that they're not marked. So that's all there is to it. And uh, this is a kind of a typical way to use the scheme. If the property is of the form you know, somewhere in the network, something good happened, then you can often have the spanning tree to locate the place where the good thing happened and prove that it exists. All right. Um, okay, so where is this model coming from? Who is this all powerful prover in the network? In a distributed network, the, the accurate description is the one that I said before, where every node only knows their own local perspective of the network. So what's this prover doing here? The answer is actually the prover is the network in the past. So the reason that this model is interested in distributed systems is often when you run a distributed algorithm, you're worried about its correctness. First off, just its correctness period, because distributed algorithms can be very hard to get right. And second, even if it was correct at the time, distributed networks are very dynamic. Links can fail, people can move around, join, leave. So even if the answer was correct at the time, it's good to be able to check if the answer is still appropriate for the network the way it is right now. So you can think of the prover as just a distributed algorithm that ran in the past. And in order to provide some degree of fault tolerance or something called self-stabilization, distributed computing, after running this algorithm, I'd like to check is the output correct and still relevant to the network after it potentially has changed. All right, so I can just have this algorithm certify its output. And this mechanism gives me a very lightweight way to check these certificates because it's super fast. You just talk to your neighbors and hopefully it's also efficient in terms of communication, but that's only if the certificates are short. So we haven't talked about complexity yet. Okay, and, and this uh, kind of uh, fault tolerant mechanism was actually uh, implicit in pretty early work on fault tolerance and on self-stabilization. For example, this paper from 91, um, but the special thing that they did in this 2005 paper that I'm describing now is they pulled it out and they gave it its own name and said, this is an interesting thing to study, <coughs> an interesting mechanism that we should study for its own sake and try to make it efficient. Um, so that is kind of where this comes from. Okay. A generic construction, by the way, any algorithm can certify its own execution just by recording its own execution. So if you have an algorithm that runs for some number of rounds and it sends M messages at every node, and each one of those messages has B bits, you can just record this entire trace of the execution. That will take you roughly this many bits. You do need to remember round numbers and so on. So there's some stuff I'm not actually writing here. And then you can verify that this is consistent because if you look at what your neighbors have done and what you did, you can ask yourself, all right, if this is what has happened to me in the first five rounds, would I really do this in the next round? If you verify this for every round, then you're verifying the trace of the error. <clears throat> this is only for deterministic algorithms, randomized algorithms, something different. And um, actually, this is pretty efficient for some problems, like this connectivity scheme that I showed you. It is basically the trace of the natural algorithm for checking connectivity. But it's not always so great. If you look at other problems like minimum weight spanning tree, taking this approach would give you certificates of roughly square root n bits per node. But actually, it is known that this can be certified in log squared n. So sometimes a bit of additional cleverness is required. Okay, um, there have been many extensions of this basic model. The original model is restrictive. You only talk to your neighbors. The way you talk to your neighbors is you send them your certificate, and then you have to decide and that's it. And there's many ways to generalize this. You can talk about round space trade-offs. What if I can talk to nodes that are farther away from me 
does that let me have shorter certificates? And the answer is yes. Sometimes we actually don't have a perfect understanding of this. Uh, you can add randomization. It's super natural and super useful to do that. So after seeing the certificates, maybe I can toss some coins and I'm going to use that to make my decision. Um, you can have weaker notions of what I need to decide. Like you can have property testing or approximation instead of a property that is perfectly yes or no. Maybe there is some fudge factor in that property. Um, and you can do many other things. We can joint work with Gilat and a former student. We looked at interaction with the prover uh, and, and various other things. Um, but the common thing to all of this work is that the complexity measures that we care about are first off, locality radius. Uh, what is the distance away from myself that I need to communicate? And this corresponds to number of rounds for the verification procedure. And the other measure is just bit complexity. When I talk to my neighbors, how many bits do I need to send? <clears throat> and this is basically an information theoretic model. So if you have acquired some message from your neighbor, you can compute whatever you want on this message, it's not even a uniform model. For all I care, you can solve the halting problem as, as part of your decision procedure, that's fine. Right, so it's a very classical distributed computing model. This is the way we often think about things because communication is an interesting enough bottleneck to make this worthwhile. Um, but that is what we wanted to change. Okay, so let me show you why we wanted to change that in this work. So there's a few drawbacks to this plain model. First off, this is more of an aesthetic consideration. You know, if you're an algorithm designer, you probably don't care about this too much, but there is by now this whole attempt to have this complexity theory, trading off various resources against one another and so on. But the distributed certification one is completely separate from classical complexity theory because there is no computation there. So you just can't compare these things. And there are problems that are easy for computation, but hard for distributed certification, like computing the diameter, obviously that's a peak. Um, but you can show that the size of the certificates for this problem needs to be linear in the size of the network, so that's very bad. And also the opposite is true. It's easy to find the problem in non-deterministic exponential time, which is easily certifiable you can just encode it as like giving the input to this problem to one node. Nobody else is doing anything interesting. This node is going to decide. So nothing interesting is actually happening here. It's just that we're comparing apples and oranges. So that's one thing that people have been a bit unhappy about in this line of work. Uh, and the other reason we might want to change things is that actually there are properties that are very hard to certify. They require very long certificates. It can get as bad as n squared. Remember I showed you, you can do anything in n squared? That is actually tight. Some things require n squared. And here's an easy way to see that. So uh, you can think of networks that have this structure. The network is built out of two parts. And there's only one edge connecting these two parts. This part has n squared bits of information in it because it's a graph. And this part also has n squared bits of information in it. And if you need to decide the property that depends on both of them, well, how are you going to do that? And so the prover is there, it will help you. But the only way that it actually is helping you is with these two certificates at the endpoints of this edge. Because the prover can do whatever it wants to do in here. And whatever it wants to do in here, there is no way to check consistency between these two parts. <laughs> except through this edge. So if these certificates are too short, you can run into a situation where too much information is flowing across this bottleneck, and that's just impossible. And the way to formalize this is through non-deterministic communication complexity. I won't get into that too much, um, but you can basically inherit a host of lower bounds and apply them to get lower bounds for distributed certification. So obviously this is a synthetic thing that I'm showing here. It's not actually an interesting property, but there are interesting properties. For example, uh, graph asymmetry, non-three colorability, a bunch of other things, especially if you care about the input. If you want, for example, to prove that every node has a unique input, well, that's hard. 
Okay, and uh, one thing that we noticed while working on these lower bounds and maybe uh, coming up with new ones is that actually, if only we had a good hash function, a lot of these lower bounds would go away. Because if I could, for example, hash down this input and hash this down, then maybe the fact that these certificates are short wouldn't be such a bad thing. Maybe the hash would be enough to connect these two parts of the network to be. But a hash function uh, exists in a different world. It's a computational object, right? So in order to ask this question, we needed to move over to a model that is not purely information theoretic, where we also have computational considerations. And that's what we did here. Um, so that's uh, basically our work, a computationally sound version of these distributed proofs. And um, I'll, I'll give you some background on what these things are in the usual sense, in the centralized sense, and then I'll tell you how we extended it to the distributed. So what is a computationally sound proof? It's also called an argument often. Uh, the setup is that we have some polynomial Turing machine, and we have an input, and we'd like to check if this machine accepts this input. And as usual, uh, we have the verifier. Here, the verifier is super efficient, it runs in polylogarithmic time at the length of the input. And we also have the prover. The prover is more powerful than the verifier, but it's not all powerful. It runs in polynomial. That's one possible setup. There are many other ways to restrict the verifier and the prover so that the verifier is weaker than the prover and it's, it's interesting. <coughs> okay, so both of the uh, entities here, the verifier and the prover, know the input X. And on top of that, they have some shared randomness that they can use. And the prover is going to generate some proof, trying to convince the verifier that this machine accepts the input. And then the verifier looks at the proofs and, and, and it uh, decides if it accepts or rejects. And we still want uh, completeness in sound, but now they will be computational completeness in sound. So what does that mean? Completeness usually is not changed, except to ask that the prover be actually efficient. So if the machine does accept this input, then there should be a polynomial time loop that convinces the verifier to accept. The proof by can be long and the verifier has random access to it. There's many different models. Okay, no, I'm not thinking yeah, but actually, for you. For me, no. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, get to this in one second, yeah. Um, and, and the computational soundness is the interesting weakening here, which is that it's okay if some prover can fool me into accepting, but no efficient prover can fool me into accepting when I shouldn't except with negligible probability. And what is this uh, negligible probability notion? So typically you set some security parameter, which is denoted lambda. And negligible in lambda means smaller than any poly one over lambda. Okay, so it's very, it's really like negligible. In particular, being this small means you can often survive a union bound over many such events and so on. So that's why this definition is, is the right. And what is the length of the proof? So the proof should be short, it should be succinct. And that means for us, it should be polylogarithmic in the input and polynomial in the security. Okay, this is uh, often referred to as a SNARG, which is short for succinct, non-interactive arguments. Uh, the crypto people are amazing at coming up with acronyms. <laughs> I am truly inspired <laughs> looking at the literature there. Okay, so that is the centralized version of this model. Um, and let me just tell you what we know how to do. So Silvio Micali was one of the first people to come up with this notion. And he showed that you can construct such proofs if you're in a model called the random oracle model, so that's a kind of assuming you have an idealized hash function, perfectly random, completely unbreakable in any way, then you can do this. 
But this model is considered kind of a little bit uh, not satisfactory by some people, not by everyone, because we don't know how to build this out of standard assumptions. It's assuming you have a perfect hash function, but it's not a concrete assumption that you can break and say, no, this assumption is false, and I'll show you why. Right? So then later on, there was a, a lot of work that I'm not writing here. Um, and Kilian come before. Kilian came before, but Kilian didn't uh, do the actual non-interactive yeah. part yet. Uh, but it is based on the PCP idea by Kilian. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so finally, after a, a long line of work, there was this breakthrough uh, by Chadori, Jane, and Jin, where they showed from a standard assumption, learning with errors, I won't get into that, but it is something that you could potentially break. They showed how to get snarks for any function in I. And this is in the common reference string model, which means that the prover and the verifier have shared randomness. And that's kind of essential. You can't get away with that. Um, and after that, there was follow-up work. And the most relevant for us here is this paper, uh, which some people in this audience will know, <laughs> uh, from last year, where they uh, did a, a version of this construction, which is much more modular. So here you can kind of plug and play any hash function that you want and so on, assuming it satisfies certain conditions. So it's not necessarily tied now to this specific assumption. Right? And we were really inspired by the construction in this paper. Uh, a lot of what we did is based on extending this to the distributed one. Okay, so let me show you what we did and I'll start with an easy kind of a baby version of it. And then if there's time, I'll show you a little bit about the full version. So the baby version is where the prover is global. It knows the entire input. All right, so what am I trying to do here? Take the verifier, and instead of having one verifier that knows the input, now my verifier will be a distributed network, which also means that the input, which is this distributed network, right? is not known to any single entity now. So it's kind of jointly held by the different pieces of the verifier, but there is no single entity that knows the entire input. And that will be the challenge here, the classical SNAR constructions, you have the verifier, it has the input, it will read the input, so we can't actually do that straight away. Uh, so here's a, there, there is a pretty uh, simple way to overcome that, and I'll, I'll show you that way. So what are the ingredients I need for this construction? First off, I, I need a snarg. I'm going to be using it as a black box. And the other thing that I need is a cryptographic object called the collision-resistant hash family with local openings. What is this? So first off, collision-resistance means it's hard to find two inputs hash to the same thing, all right? So no polynomial time adversary is able to do that, except with negligible probability. And this local opening thing is really interesting. So the assumption is this will be my interface. It's a hash function that hashes down a vector of values, right? And this is my interface. First off, there is a randomly chosen member of this hash family. Which so is when you hash down a vector of values, it's one function applied to the vector. Yes, I'll show, I'll show the interface. So th this is the interface. So the input is this vector. And the way I interact with this is, first off, I can hash it. So I give it the hash key, which is like selecting one hash function from this family. And I give it the vector. And it produces one thing, one hash value. And now we come to the local openings part. So the other two things I can do here is, first off, I can say, I would like to inspect the ith element, right? So this produces an opening, something called an opening, and you should think of an opening as like a key. It's not actually giving me what's in there. It's just giving me sort of a key for index i. And then what do I do with this key? I can verify that the thing in location i is what I think it is. All right, so you access the hash with your key and with your value that you think should be there. And then verify will say yes or no, that's actually what is hidden inside this. Okay. 
right? And if there's time, I'll show you how to construct this. If you've heard of a Merk uh, Merkle tree, that's <laughs> and you can also think of this as like a binding commitment, which is a super useful object. It's a way for the prover to commit to a whole bunch of things in such a way that if it later tells me, oh, that's what I put here, I can check that that's what it actually put. Okay, so these are the, the basic ingredients. Any questions about this? All right, so how do we use this, right? It's like a distributed version of a SNARG. <coughs> uh, the input is going to be a graph and an input, a configuration. But for simplicity, I'm just going to assume here, first off, that the network nodes are numbered 1 to n. We don't really need this assumption, but it makes life easier. And I'm also going to assume there's no input. So there's the graph, and that's all I care about. I'm checking some property of the graph itself. And that's uh, what this means, that the only input here is essentially this adjacency matrix of the graph. It's a bunch of rows. Each row represents the neighborhood of one of the nodes. And the node knows that. So if I'm node one, I know the first row in this matrix. If I'm node two, I know the second row, and so on. So the prover is going to hash down the adjacency matrix. The vector here will be the first row, the second row, to the last row, uh, and it produces one hash on this entire thing. And then it's going to give each node first off the hash, second, the opening to that node row, the opening to position i, the node. And finally, it's going to give a snog proof for the statement that the graph satisfies the property we care about. I'm already lying to you a little bit. Let's see if you can figure out. Okay, so how do we verify this? Right? We need to check a couple of things. The cheater, the, the prover can cheat, for example, by giving different hashes to different nodes. That would be bad, right? It can cheat by giving something that doesn't open to my actual neighborhood. That's also bad. And it can cheat by giving snark that doesn't prove what it should prove. So we need to check each of these three things. Uh, the the uh, verification at node up. <coughs> you check that your neighbors have the same hash as you. You check that the hash opens to your neighborhood in position. And you verify the snark. And here we have an issue. Okay, what, what does it mean to verify this? We said the SNARG proof has a verifier and a prover. The verifier knows the input. Uh, how, how can I verify the SNARG proof if I don't know the input? Okay, so the SNARG is actually proving the statement. There is some Turing machine that we agreed on in advance, which is for this property, for deciding this property P, and it accepts the graph. But no single node knows the graph. So I can't actually verify this snark proof. So we need to do something to fix that. And here was our initial attempt. Okay, this was what we had before. We first said, okay, instead of giving a snark proof for the graph G, satisfies the property, let's instead prove, well, there exists a graph G prime that satisfies the property and also attaches to the same thing as my graph. So it is my graph, right? It hashes to the same. Uh, and this is us as uh, crypto naive people coming at this. But I, I wanted to show you this because I think it is uh, interesting, right? So why doesn't this work? So the way you would try to verify this is just like before, you verify that we all have the same hash. You verify that it opens correctly to your neighborhood. And now you can verify the snark. Because this snark actually has no input, right? There is no graph. I'm proving that there exists a graph. Please. So I, I can verify. There's uh, two issues here. First off, this is no longer a P statement because it says there exists some G prime doing something. So this is an NP. That's already a problem because there is no known snark construction for NP. Uh, so we can't obviously assume that there is one, there isn't. 
But even if there was such a thing, this construction still wouldn't work. It still wouldn't be good. So the three things we want are completeness, soundness, succinctness. Succinctness holds, right? The hash is short. The opening is short. I didn't say that, but it needs to be short. And that's uh, part of the certificate. So that's good. Completeness holds an honest prover. If the graph does satisfy the property, it can construct the right hash. It can construct the right mark proof, and that will pass verification. Right. So these two are good. But what about sounds? We actually don't know if this is sound or not. And I wanted to show you why the natural way to try to prove that it is sound doesn't work. So what do you do to prove that a construction like this is sound? It's a type of reduction. You want to prove that if there is a polynomial time prover that can break my distributed norm, well, I can take that prover and construct from it a uh, adversary that breaks one of the building blocks that I used. And since I'm assuming that those are correct, well, that's my proof of sound. So what is there to break here? I can try to break one of two things. I can try to break the snar, the centralized snar, or I can try to break the collision resistant hash. Either of those would be good, but can we do that? Okay, so first off, if you tell me, let's assume for the sake of contradiction that there is a prover breaks my construction, what is that prover actually doing? It produces a graph G and the certificates. So that means it also produces this hash function and all the openings and the snark proof, and those fool everybody into accepting. And what I need to construct, if I decide to go down this path, what I need to find is uh, construct a false statement X, something that is not true, and a convincing proof for this thing. And in our case, the reasonable candidate for a false statement would be there exists a graph G prime that satisfies the property and hashes to H. Unfortunately, that might be true. I don't know if that's true or not, right? I know that my graph doesn't satisfy the property, but I don't know that there isn't some other graph out there that satisfies it and hashes to the same thing. It's quite conceivable that there is. So I can't go down this path. What about the other path? Can we break? the collision resistant hash. So in order to do that, we need to find a hash value and a specific index and opening for that index. And two values such that I can convince you that in position I, it is both of those values. Right? So the verification succeeds for both of them. That's what it means to do the hash. So here, yeah, of course we can do that. The prover has G and it proved that there's a G prime that hashes to the same thing. And it's not my G because my G doesn't satisfy the property. So yeah, that's obviously what we should do, except we can't because we don't have G prime. We don't even know if the prover has G prime. The prover was able to prove this statement I don't know how it did that. I don't know that it thought of a concrete G prime and then proved that G prime satisfies the property and hashes to H. I only know it was able to produce a convincing proof. That's all I have. So this soundness proof doesn't go through. For us, this was especially interesting because in the distributed world, when we use cryptography, we often use it as this idealized black box. Like if you look at consensus protocols, at the Bitcoin protocol and so on, it uses cryptography in this naive way, which assumes that all of these primitives are perfect. They cannot be broken. So you don't even have to go through proofs like this. This is an issue of composition. I used two building blocks. I'm trying to compose them. It doesn't work. If you're using the idealized version of these primitives, you don't notice that. You don't see this kind of issue. So that was very illuminating for us. OK, so there's, there's a few ways you could try to tackle this. Uh, first off, what is the thing that went wrong here? Yeah, we were trying to prove an NP statement, not a P statement. 
And the NP statements that you want to prove are all over the place. Often on the blockchain, there are statements saying, there is a key to my Bitcoin wallet, which I know you don't know, but this key will open the wallet and then you can see that I have $100,000. Right, so those statements are pretty common. Um, and there is a way to prove them, which just makes more assumptions. So this is called a snark, a succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And the of knowledge part basically says, if you give me a cheating prover that can convince me of a false statement, then from the code of this prover, I can extract a witness. It's basically saying, there is no way to construct a proof of this without having access to W. So I can see W from your code if you're doing it. Right? That's a snark. Uh, there are barriers saying you cannot construct these things out of any falsifiable assumption. Okay, there's some technical details here. I'm not going to go into them. But uh, many people are perfectly happy using them <laughs> anyway. Right? Uh, for example, there's a startups. ZK, uh, like uh, Zcash and, and others, Oops. these snarks are all in the um, So yeah, so we actually had some some pushback from our crypto collaborators who said, yeah, what's wrong with the snark? What do you want? What do you have against it? <laughs> but we, we still uh, wanted to see if we could only rely on uh, standard assumptions and not need to have this knowledge property. And we wanted to really just use the snark and not the snark. All right, so that's one way to circumvent this. There is another way to circumvent this, which is to use a, a really cool special type of snark, where this is called a RAM snark for technical reasons. I, probably not a great name because the interesting thing here is not the RAM. It's the fact that here the verifier isn't actually given the input. It's only given a hash on the input, which is exactly what we were doing. So instead of giving it the full input, it gets only H, the hash of the input. And now, what does it even mean that the statement is true or not true? There's many things that can hash to H. So what does it mean that the statement is true? Well, the soundness here is something different. It means it is hard for an efficient prover to find a hash H and to find a proof that convinces me that the Turing machine accepts it and also a proof that convinces me that the Turing machine rejects it. So now soundness means the prover cannot prove two contradictory things about this hash that it found. Right? There is no actual X here anywhere. This is what soundness means. What the assumption really for? So this you can construct from standard assumptions. Um, and uh, that's actually what their paper from last year is doing. You don't even need such a strong soundness guarantee, right? You could just have that it's hard to find an input X such that the verifier like uh, believes that M of X equals the wrong value when given hash of X. Yes. We, we toyed around with a few of those uh, soundness notions. Uh, for a while, we were lost in the sea of different soundness definitions. Uh, but this one ends up being good for us uh, because we have the actual graph G and we know that it satisfies the statement. So I can construct this proof easily, showing that it satisfies the statement. And then if there is a cheating prover, it provides the other half of this, the proof that convinces me that the statement is wrong. When you said we in this uh, sentence meant the prover, correct prover. Yes, yeah. yes. Me as the one who's trying to prove one of the building blocks, given a cheating prover for the distributed snow. So then the soundness proof becomes pretty straightforward and standard, and that's what we were able to do here. There's still a few subtleties you, you need to take care with. For example, uh, if I don't know the size of the graph, the prover could give me something bigger than the actual graph. It could hash down something longer. Uh, the only verification I'm doing about the graph is <laughs> nodes open their own neighborhoods. So if what was hatched is something maybe bigger, there are maybe some parts that will never be opened by anybody. So the prover could try to trick me that way and you need to do a bit more work to make sure it can't. But this part is, is uh, pretty straightforward. All right, so that, that's the warm up. <laughs> Any questions about it? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still kind of confused by this, the uh, definition. Like, you're saying that there cannot be like proof that the input that 
hashes to H is accepted or any input that hashes to H is rejected, but like why, like isn't there supposed to be like an existential quantifier or something like? Yeah, this is wishful thinking, the part in the uh, quotation marks, okay? So there is no actual, the, the input that hashes to X. There is a verification procedure. <clears throat> it gets the hash, it gets a bit saying, I'm trying to convince you to say yes, or I'm trying to convince you to say no, and it gets the proof. That's it. And the prover cannot produce a single H and two proofs such that the verification for no and the verification for yes both go through. All right, so quotation marks is like intuition or misleading intuition. But the point being is that you're doing your verification on the half a hash and you don't you don't really care about like what was hashed or what. yes so the inputs the actual input is only here for the completeness part if the statement is true well the prover will take the input and use it to construct a good proof but when it comes to soundness there's no actual input here there's only the hash there is no spoon <laughs> yeah so why doesn't it give you a snark actually of what's what's missing? Why can't you prove that you have a hundred thousand uh, dollars? I am not producing a witness out of this, and I'm not proving an NP statement. The statement has to be NP. Still, here we're using as a black box this uh, rev snark construction. We're not doing anything on top of it. We're not producing any witness or or trying to prove this of knowledge. <laughs> So this is also based on uh, NW. Yeah, but now after the work from last year by Alex and others, it can be based on uh, many other assumptions. Okay, so um, ultimately what we were able to show here, since all the building blocks are succinct, they have this polylogarithmic length. Uh, if you set the soundness parameter Usually in this model, we take it to be constant because okay, so we don't actually need this lambda and so on. So you can use this to uh, certify any network property in P using these short certificates. Uh, is that what I promised you that we would do? <coughs> Not quite, because I said that the motivation is to self-certify, to have a distributed algorithm convince you that it, it did the right thing. And so far, for this construction, I needed a global prover. I needed a prover that sees the entire network and produces this hash of the entire network. Uh, so we can't actually have that. So what are we actually going to do? So that's what we did so far, right? And now we also want to go after this part and make the prover also distributed. And more concretely, what I would like to do is take any efficient distributed algorithm. And efficient for me just means polynomial. Everything is polynomial. Number of rounds is polynomial. Bits are polynomial. Computation steps, polynomial, everything. And I want to add a small overhead on top of it to produce these certificates. OK, but I don't want to ruin its efficiency. If it was efficient, I want to be efficient prime, slightly less efficient. And specifically, what we were able to show is that you can do a, a short certification piece after the algorithm. It will take on the order of the diameter of the network many rounds. It will send short bits, uh, short messages of polylog length, and it will produce these certificates that certify the execution. And what does it mean to certify the execution? It's properties of the form GXY saying when I ran the algorithm, on G with input X, its output was Y. That's the property we would like to prove. Right, and, and we uh, we did this using this pretty recently developed machinery of Seabargs. So touch on them, maybe, probably not. Um, but they are super cool and mind blowing. And in recent work, we were able to improve this to kind of shave down the overhead from something that is a bit global because it depends on the diameter of the network. So if you do it more cleverly, you can actually get it down to a constant. All right. Yeah. So we're here in the polynomial is in the polynomial distributed algorithm is polynomial in N or log N? Yeah, it's polynomial in N. I see. Yeah. You can assume without loss of generality. 
that it runs for some p of n many rounds. In every round, every node sends a single bit. So that's actually the next slide. Oh, this is my standard disclaimer. Uh, from now on, I'm going to be lying even more than I was lying until now. Uh, just because the technical details do get a bit hairy here. So first off, what is a distributed algorithm? What is the thing that I'm trying to certify? It is something that runs in a network. Every node does its own thing. And this is a synchronous model. It operates in computation rounds. In every round, you start from some state. You send a message on each one of your edges. You then receive the messages that your neighbors have sent to you. And then you transition internally to a new state. That's the algorithm. And I would like to produce a certificate saying that when I run this whole thing on global input X, the global output. Okay. The hard thing here is actually this piece. I could just take SNAR constructions as a black box and write down a proof saying all the internal steps that this node did were correct. It, when it was in this state, it would indeed produce these messages. And then if it received these messages from its neighbors, it would indeed transition to that. But the hard part is we actually have to do some sort of consistency check here, relating the messages that one node sends to the messages that its neighbors receive, because the algorithm is doing that, right? So that's the interesting part here how to certify the communication between the nodes. That is the part that is not present in the centralized world and is the main interesting thing for us. So how do you verify the messages? Well, when you've executed the algorithm, you can save the entire transcript. Uh, it's pretty space inefficient, but for this work, we don't care about that at all. Just save everything you've ever sent or received on all of your edges. I can't afford to put that in the certificate because it can be very long, but I can hash it. Right? Maybe I can use that to check consistency with my neighbors. But it's not that easy, actually. So I'll I'll see. I'll go ahead. yeah. So let's see what uh, what is is not going to work. Right. One thing that is a bad idea here is to just hash all the messages on all the edges and all the rounds together. I produce one hash. It's quite succinct. That's, that, that's great. But how do I check consistency? If I just have one hash, which is like all the messages together, how do I then check? Well, if I'm Avi's neighbor, Avi has a hash of everything he talked to everybody about, and he talks to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the hash of what I said with my neighbor. How do I pull out one edge out of that and make sure that what we talked to each other is correct? And you have this local opening. Yes, indeed. So that will be happening. Um, here's just another uh, red herring, another thing that you should not do. Um, it's not a good idea to hash the messages on every edge separately. That would take care of consistency pretty easily, right? If I have a hash of just what Avi and I talked about, we can send each other these hashes and make sure they're the same. That does ensure that everything I think he sent me and everything he thinks he sent me, agree. The problem with this is it takes up too much space. I can have a lot of neighbors. I don't want to store a separate hash for each one of my neighbors. So what we're looking for is one hash that I can do many consistency checks on top. And Avi is exactly right. The way we're going to do that is to implement a collision resistance hash family with local openings, which will let me open individual messages on individual edges, but the only person who will be able to open it is one of the two nodes on that edge. Okay. So like a like distributed construction of a method. Okay, Abby, obviously you should have written this paper because you're predicting. Uh, so that's just a reminder of the interface uh, that this is essentially what we're going to implement. And uh, Avi was exactly correct. So I'm going to skip ahead. Actually, I won't skip, but it will be a distributed Merkle. 
that will be what we will do. So first off, just in case you haven't seen it, uh, Merkle tree is a nice way to construct these hash functions with a local opening. So if I want to hash down a vector, the way I do it is this recursive tree construction where you first hash each of the inputs, the elements in the vector. Then you hash together every pair of hashes and you continue doing this until you have a single hash. This is called the root tree, the Merkle tree. That will be the hash value. So that's the hash of all these things. And then how do I open and how do I verify? So in order to open, let's say I want to open this one. Okay, so just produce the key. This one. Well, I, the prover, know this entire tree. When you ask me to produce an opening for location three, I'm going to look at the path down to location three, but also at the siblings on this down. And the opening will just be these hash values, the sibling hash values. That's what I'm going to provide as the key. And how do I do the verification? So now I am no longer from the perspective of the, the prover. Now I am the verifier. I don't know the value. I only have the hash. I have the opening provided to me, the key. And I have the thing that I think should be here that I'm trying to check actually is there. Right. So that's all I know. But now I can actually verify that this matches the structure of the tree the way I would do it. I compute the hash of what I think should be in location three. And now I know the sibling because that was provided to me. It's part of the opening. So I hash these two together and I get something, right? And I continue to hash with the siblings, which I have as part of the opening until I have the root. And then I verify that the root really is the hash value that was given to me. That's how the Merkle tree works. And it's clear why you need collision resistance. Yes. You need collision resistance because I'm assuming that it's hard for the adversary to fool me, right? To provide, for example, incorrect siblings that would hash to the right. Okay, so we're looking for a distributed version of this, a distributed Merkle tree, DMT for short, and that's what we did here. So I'll show you. Um, will I show you? I probably won't show you. You can show me. Okay. So this, this is the way that uh, it's, it's uh, built up, essentially. So at the bottom, the thing I am hashing is all the messages sent throughout the algorithm. I want to get one hash of all of these things. And the internal structure will be every node has its own root, its own local root, which is just a hash of its own messages that it sent. Right. So under this global root for the entire network, there's a collection of local roots, one per node. And that's a hash of everything you sent, you knows what it sent. So it can compute this part of the tree. And in, indeed, it will be doing that. All right. So what is happening inside here? It also matters the way you organize this part of the hash. So under here, you is going to separately hash every edge, all the messages sent on every edge. So there will be a smaller root inside these local root, which corresponds to a single edge, right? And all the messages that were sent on that edge. Okay. The important thing here is being able to open. Who can touch which, which parts of this tree? So who, first of all, who needs to touch what? A node needs to touch the messages that it sent as part of its proof to convince you that it, it was supposed to send these messages. But also it needs to touch the messages that it received because it needs to convince you that it acted correctly upon receiving those messages. All right, so how do we do that? Oh, that's an important part here. This green piece, which is the hash of the messages sent from you to V I for a specific I, this is known to you who sent those messages. It's also known to VI who received those messages. At the time I construct the proof, right? Afterward, it's forget everything. But at the time when the proof is being constructed, both you and VI can construct the screen tree. Okay, so how do I open stuff in this tree? 
if I am the sender and I want to open a specific message that I sent, well, as part of the tree construction, I will be provided with the path down to my local route and this piece of the opening, this part of the opening. And I can compute everything I need inside here because I built this. I built the, the local part of the street. All right, so that's easy. What about from the other side, the receiver node, VI? So VI didn't build this whole tree for you. It couldn't have. It doesn't know all the messages that you sent. But fortunately, it can talk to node you and ask it things. And so what it's going to do, ask node you how to go down to the local root of you and how to go down from the root of you to this smaller edge root. And once I have this, well, remember the green tree can be constructed by this neighbor too. So it doesn't need anything more. It can compute everything else by itself. So during the proving stage, the nodes are able to touch and open the various parts of the tree only the ones that they need to, but that's fine. Okay, so um, and yeah, then it can follow the, the internal structure. So how do you construct this? I said I wanted a low overhead construction. So it's not like I want to bring all the messages to one place and then construct this tree. No, I want an efficient construction where every node does part of the work. We then aggregate things efficiently and come up with first off the hash. Second, every node needs to know the opening down to its local root and the, the path. So you just do it using a spanning tree. You start by having every node compute its own local root, the hash of the messages that it sent. Then you compute a spanning tree of the network. You aggregate the roots up the tree, which just means you get hash values from your children. You hash them together and you get a new hash and you send that up. Right? And eventually at the root of the spanning tree, you have the root of the distributed Merkle tree. Then you need to follow this by a kind of down propagation phase that produces the openings. So the root of the spanning tree knows how to open only down to the hashes that it received. But then these hashes were produced by other nodes. They append more and more stuff to the openings until eventually every node has the entire opening down to its local root. Right, so I have an example of this, um, but I'm not actually good at it. It's pretty simple, right? Um, however, you should admire my effort at animation. <laughs> okay, yeah, one thing that actually you need to be careful about, okay? So if all you do is what I said so far, you hash everything you have, you send it up, and then you continue hashing and so on, if your network has a large diameter, like this network, which has diameter m minus one, uh, you're going to have a very bad tree. You'll get a tree that has depth n minus one. Okay, so what's the problem with that? The problem is the openings will be very long as well, because I need to give you all the siblings on the path to the root. So I wanted openings of polylogarithmic length. This is no good if this happens. Okay, so, but all that means is you need to be a little bit more clever when you're doing the hashing up the tree and then down the tree. Instead of greedily hashing everything you can, what you can do is only hash together trees of the same height. So you're enforcing perfect balance this way, but you don't necessarily have a single hash now. You have like a forest, things you've merged, uh, but uh, but that's fine. There's not too many roots in this forest because there's at most one per height, right? Otherwise, I would have merged. So what you send up to your parent is these roots. And then this process continues until eventually the root of the spanning tree has a collection of roots and it merges them all the way together to come up with this final hash. And this way you do get a distributed Merkle tree of good depth, um, which means that the openings and the indices and everything will be short. Sorry, I didn't follow this explanation. What happens on the line? Like what happens if you're aligned? Yeah, so basically um, this node sends a hash to this node who has its own hash, it merges it together. Now we have a tree of depth two. 
it sends the tree of depth to here, but this will not be merged. Okay, so this okay. guy sends one depth two and one depth one. So partial merging is happening all the way to make sure the messages are not too wide, right? But the balance is in front. Okay, um, I am going to completely skip over this part um, where we really took the existing SNARK construction. Unfortunately, we could not use it as a black box. We had to open the black box down to like one level and use uh, this uh, really cool CBARG thing. I uh, warmly recommend uh, reading these papers. I really loved reading them. Um, so we followed these constructions. Basically, um, what you're trying to prove is an AND over many small statements, where each of the small statements asserts that I did one computation step correct. Right? And it turns out that even though it is not known how to construct SNARKs for NP, for this flavor of statement, it is possible to have a succinct from standard assumptions uh, with a kind of magical crypto property. Um, and we use this uh, to blah, 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 uh, eventually end up with our construction. Just to mention, what does our construction actually give you? The soundness that we wanted is for any network configuration and claimed output Y, if when you execute the distributed algorithm, it doesn't produce, then no polynomial time prover can produce a proof that convinces you that it does. And that's uh, different from this kind of uh, soundness property that is going on in these RAM smart constructions. So even though we were using many of the common ideas, our notion of soundness is different, it's weaker in some sense, but it is very appropriate for us because we have a network that we care about that is our input. We don't have a hash, that's not our input. Okay, so that's what we wanted. Okay, so let me conclude. So this area of distributed certification um, it is a, a pretty uh, lively area in distributed computing. It comes out of work on fault tolerance, but now it's acquired its own life and became an interesting area in its own way. Uh, it has these connections to complexity theory and to crypto, which I think are really interesting. Um, in this work, we looked at a uh, computational version of the model. Uh, in prior work with uh, some people here, we've looked at uh, other, other related questions. For example, we've asked, can you get uh, certifications that preserve privacy? And that is a type of zero knowledge we're asking for. Um, can you gain efficiency by building an interaction with the prover? And, and many types of trade-offs between the different resources here the rounds, the space, randomization, and so on. Right, there, there's a lot of work remaining to do. For example, everything or almost everything up to now, even though the motivation is from fault tolerance, it actually doesn't cope with faults. Like if a node in the network is trying to be me when we're trying to do the proof, it's trying to fool me, I can't cope with that at this point. I cannot produce a good proof despite a small number of malicious nodes in the network. So that I think is very interesting to look at. Uh, just some uh, other thing that I think would be interesting to explore. So I mentioned that the lower bounds in this area often come from the world of communication complexity. And you can use those bounds to get to really strong bounds on the size of the certificate. Now, obviously when you move to the computational setting, these bounds won't give you what you want anymore because they're information theoretic. But you can ask, is there some computationally bounded notion of non-deterministic communication complexity? And if you consider a computationally bounded variant, it can do a lot of things. So if all I want is that no efficient prover can find an input and a proof that makes me say yes when I shouldn't, then actually any function in P, it's really easy to see that there is a communication protocol using only polylogarithmically many bits. Not easy, you need to know that a snark exists, okay? But once you know that, it is easy. 
basically all the prover needs to do is give you hashes of the two inputs and the slot <coughs> saying that they <coughs> satisfy F together. And the two players are able to check their own hashes and check the snark proof. So what can you still hope to extract here? You can hope to prove that if I do have such a super efficient protocol, which breaks the information theoretic lower bound, then that implies some sort of cryptography. Maybe it implies the existence of one way functions. And maybe aiming lower, it just implies that P is different from X. You know, maybe just, is there something that needs to happen to enable this type of super short protocols to exist? And I'll mention that there is already work in this direction by Moni Nao, and I forget the first name of this student Cohen. Um, and they looked at the equality two party function with no prover, just standard communication complexity. And they proved that equality, if you can do it super efficiently, well, yeah, it applies one way functions because it essentially is like building a hash function. All right, so I'm going to end here uh, slightly late, but not too much, hopefully. Thanks uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. What goes wrong if you have an input? This was just a graph configuration. Oh, nothing goes wrong. It's just an added computation. Well, I was looking for that. No, no, no. <laughs> it's just more notation on top of a lot of notation. Oh, question. Lunch. Lunch. Yeah.